This week, prominent criminal defense attorney Ed Rucker, author of The Justice Makes a Killing, talks about where he gets his material. A high-profile murder trial has all the drama that a good story should have. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley. My co-host, Caroline Kilborn, is not with us today because she has some other family events. As you know, if you've listened to this much, Caroline's my mother, and uh, she's with my my brother and niece right now. So, I'm flying solo, but I have a really interesting book to bring to you today, so I don't think I'm going to run out of things to say without mom here. <laughs> Our guest today is Ed Recker. Did I pronounce that right, Ed? Yes, you did. Good right. morning. <laughs> Good morning. And the title of the book is Justice Makes a Killing, and I believe this is book two in um, the series, the Bobby Earl series. That's right. For decades, Ed was one of our most prominent criminal defense lawyers until his retirement. And during his career, he represented numerous high-profile clients, including John Orr, the greatest serial arsonist in American history, which has and he's been written about quite a bit. And um, Eddie Nash, a prominent nightclub owner who was portrayed in the film Boogie Nights, and William Harris, a member of the Symbionese Liberation Army who kidnapped Patty Hearst. His Bobby Earl novels have been praised for their authenticity as well as gripping suspense, and I can attest to that. And Justice Makes a Killing was just released in July 2019 from Chickadee Prince Books. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Ed. Well, thank you, Monica. So what, why did you, uh, did you always want to be a writer while you were doing all this high-profile defense work, or was it something that came, the idea came along later in life? No, it's something I always wanted to do. Uh, when I first started my career, like many criminal defense lawyers, I joined the public defender's office in Los Angeles to sort of learn the craft. Uh, and while there, I was uh, uh, sort of promoted to an administrative position, which allowed me the evenings not to worry about my cases, but, but to write. I wrote a uh, legal thriller way, way back. Uh, it had an agent in New York and was sent off to uh, a top publishing company that liked the book uh, but wanted to change the ending. And then I went into private practice, and private practice absorbed me so much uh, that uh, I thought, well, this sounds pretty easy. I'll get back to it later. Uh, and it <laughs> and it and it took me uh, my entire career to find the time to try and really do it. So, as you were approaching retirement, was it something you were like really looking forward to, so you'd have time to write? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> There's a, a a real sense of satisfaction of trying to craft a a good sentence, a good paragraph, and most of all, uh, to tell a interesting story. And you have a little more control over the ending than you do as a criminal defense court. lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the try, trying a, a, a case uh, before a jury is much like uh, telling a story. Uh, the defense has their version of the facts that they weave into a story, and the prosecution takes the same facts and weaves it into a far different story. Uh, so... I've actually been telling these types of stories uh, my whole career, uh, but now I've got to try and put it on the page and and make it interesting uh, enough to leap off the page to a reader. Wow. Now, in in Justice Makes a Killing, you're taking on the private prison system. Um, they're sort of the one of the, one of the enemies, one of the villains in the book. Is this? Yes. Um, something that is a cause that you are, you know, that is dear to you outside of your writing? Well, uh, when, when, when I've been writing, I find it much more interesting for the reader uh, to try and weave, weave into the story 
some of the social issues that arise in the criminal justice system. In the first book, uh, The Inevitable Witness, uh, I took on to weave in uh, the professional informants that uh, prosecutors often use uh, in their cases. And in this uh, legal thriller, uh, in addition to the, the the facts and the story of the uh, case itself, uh, I thought it would be interesting to deal with the private prison industry and the California Prison Guards Union. Uh, the sort of the, the key that set me off in this way was I was approached by a family whose son had been sentenced to prison. I didn't represent him. Uh, and they shipped him off to Mississippi, uh, where the family couldn't visit him, and he wouldn't have any of the uh, sort of support group uh, once he was released from prison and found that uh, the lawyers and the judges have no control over that. Uh, the corrections department decides to do that. So I wove it into this story where a woman, a very prominent uh, lawyer uh, in uh, Los Angeles, a partner in a powerful law firm, uh, is the spokesperson for an initiative to abolish private, the use of private prisons in California. Uh, she is uh, charged with a double murder uh, arising from the alleged assistance she gave to an inmate at a private prison uh, to help him escape. And the attempted escape results in the death of a prison guard and the inmate himself. So in preparing the defense for his client, Bobby Earl finds these shadowy forces that are working behind the scenes, the private prison industry and the California uh, Prison Guards Union. So I thought it made a, a, a good story and uh, something that people might be interested in, uh, in addition to the real story of the, the case itself. Oh, definitely. Now, in the, in the book, it says that in California, there was um, some court ruling about prison overcrowding and that was why the private prisons were able to get a foothold there um, because the taxpayers weren't wanting to build new prisons and instead of maybe looking at reducing sentences they decided to let people make money off of imprisoning people. Is that what really happened? Yes, the, there's a a symbiotic relationship between the prison guard union and the private prison industry. Uh, the prison guard union uh, started the uh, national uh, campaign to increase the length of sentences for convicted uh, felons. Uh, they were the sponsor of the original three strikes law in California, and, and that is a fact. In fact, uh, the Supreme Court Justice Kennedy, who's recently resigned uh, and retired, uh, said that in a speech at, at uh, Pepperdine Law School that the prison guard union is the sponsor of the three strikes law in California, and he said, quote, it's sick. Uh, so the longer the prison sentences, the more people you end up with in prison, because when new uh, convicted inmates arrive, the previous uh, group of inmates is still serving their, their time. So it we be ended up with such overcrowded prisons that the U.S. Supreme Court declared it was uh, a uh, unconstitutional punishment to cram all these guys together. Uh, so the result was not, was 
not to build more prisons because thanks to the prison guard union, we went from 10 prisons in a matter of a couple decades to 32 uh, prisons. Uh, and so they solved the problem of overcrowding by contracting with private prisons who uh, run the, pr they build a prison and run it on a for-profit basis. The state contracts with the private prison to house the inmates they're paid they're paid on a per day uh, per diem for the inmate so it's like a hotel uh, <laughs> and since it's since it's uh, uh, for a profit uh, anything uh, extra such as drug treatments uh, any type of rehabilitation education uh, even health uh, is is really not provided to these inmates. Which I know that here in Iowa, there's great limitations to what's provided to inmates, even though we don't have the private prison system. In our state prison system, the educational opportunities have pretty much been wiped out in recent decades. And um, it's up to an inmate it, it, to, to pay for, if they want to try and, and use their time to get an education, there's some correspondence, some colleges that will do things by correspondence, but they're expensive, and most inmates it's, can't it's afford it. It's very short-sighted. Yeah, it it's is. It's very short-sighted. Uh, we would save a lot more money if we would prepare these guys to uh, have a job, uh, support themselves, uh, become a... Uh, uh, contributing member of society uh, rather than put them in prison. And currently in California, uh, the cost of housing an inmate uh, for one year, uh, according to the, the, the Department of Corrections in California, is $70,000. <laughs> uh, you could send a child to Harvard uh, for less money than that. So... It's just dollars and cents. We 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 could do a lot better. It yeah. It just that when I hear those statistics, it just blows my mind because how can it possibly cost that much? You know, people are well, making the, a ton of money off of this. Well, the thanks to the uh, prison guards union, uh, they are the most powerful lobbying force in California. Uh, they pay dues to the union. They, the, the union uses those dues to heavily contribute to politicians' campaigns, the same politicians who set their salaries. And currently, a prison guard who uh, has graduated from high school uh, earns more with the ordinary overtime that they all arrange to have, um, more than a assistant professor at the University of California. Wow. Uh, they can make up to $100,000 a year. And there are like 36,000 uh, prison guards in, in uh, California. Is the prison guard so it's, uh, unions also contributing to campaigns for district attorneys? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah in fact, uh, uh, most, most judges are, are former prosecutors uh, because the culture around getting tough on crime uh, has led uh, the public to believe that only prosecutors would... Uh, would would really be uh, a judge uh, that would uh, have the public's interest in mind. Mm. So uh, it, it's uh, sort of a, a, a wheel of uh, <laughs> self self serving. Yeah, on, kind of on, sounds on kind of incestuous part. almost. <laughs> yeah, and I thought it would make uh, an interest uh, in the book. Uh, when Bobby Earl 
first uh, encounters his his client, uh, Kate Carlson, uh, the prominent lawyer in Los Angeles, uh, the physical evidence against her is almost overwhelming. Uh, and as he uh, is shocked to learn, uh, she says she's been framed. And as he starts to investigate the case, uh, he slowly comes to a conclusion that he didn't want to have, that any criminal defense lawyer doesn't want to have, and that is his client's innocent. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't want to think that your client's innocent? Well, it puts an awful lot of uh, pressure. pressure yeah. on, on Because the, the defense lawyer is the only one uh, responsible for proving that. And uh, so as he investigates it, uh, these two shadowy forces, the private prisons and the, uh, the prison guards union, uh, are behind the scenes uh, putting his career in danger, his, uh, ultimately his life in danger, and the story culminates in a full jury trial, which the reader can experience an authentic view of what a trial is. Because a high-profile murder trial has all the drama that a good story should have. Uh, it, it's not like Law & Order. It's a real trial. And I've tried to depict a uh, authentic criminal defense lawyer in the form of Bobby Earl, rather than the uh, sort of cardboard characters that appear on on television, uh, where the the criminal defense lawyer is is merely an extension of the criminal enterprise uh, that he's defending. Uh, so a, a a full jury trial with a cross examination of witnesses is is really high drama, uh, and hopefully I've been able to capture it on the page. So Ed, do you worry at all about you know bringing this attention to the prison guards union and that they might come after you? <laughs> oh. They, they, they are are so powerful. The, the prison guard, the uh, private prisons are a billion dollar industry. They have prisons in almost every single state. Uh, they have a private prisons internationally in many countries. Uh, so I think they're in their boardrooms. I don't think my name will be uh, come up as a threat uh, <laughs> to their profit margin. And the California Prison Guards Union, uh, as I said, are literally the most powerful lobbying force in California politics. Uh, they're so powerful that they were, uh, they demanded and received that any private prison in California has to have a, a union guard hired by them. Now, the pride in prisons don't want to do that because they pay their guards very little. Uh, but they got it. Wow. So the so, guards and the and the uh, prisons aren't always necessarily on the same side of things. Uh, well, the, the union uh, sort of runs the prison system. Uh, they, they have... Uh, contracts that specify so many regulations and rules that apply to their union members that they, in essence, uh, set the whole atmosphere of the private prison and how the, the inmates are treated. Uh, so uh, they're, 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 not, uh, they're not worried about me. <laughs> At least you hope not. But what if your book hits number one on the New York Times bestseller list and everyone's talking about it? You might ruffle some feathers. 
Well, I, I seriously doubt uh, <laughs> that uh, the uh, private prison industry or the California Prison Guards Union would uh, uh, be uh, upset enough to, to do something like that. Uh, besides, uh, the facts in the book are correct. Uh, I, in order to maintain a, a sense of authenticity, uh, I've been quite careful to only cite uh, the real facts surrounding uh, both of them. Uh, well, are, are there any journalists that are trying to call attention to this? Uh, there, there are articles uh, in the newspapers uh, concerning private prisons. There was a legislative effort to abolish private prisons in California, but uh, they were able to uh, defeat it. Um, so uh, it, it is a, a social issue. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to include it uh, in uh, uh, the book, uh, uh, because it's, uh, it's something people should be concerned about. Uh, uh, this is our our criminal justice system, and it shouldn't be something uh, that people make a profit off of. Uh, so, and it's also uh, another tangent in the in the story of the book is that the private prisons are most interested in housing uh, immigrants who have uh, crossed the border seeking uh, asylum. Uh, that's where the big money is for them because three out of every four immigrants uh, incarcerated in the United States are incarcerated in a private prison. Uh, and, and our taxpayers pay uh, millions and millions of dollars uh, to uh, those corporations. Uh, so it's something we should be concerned about, and I thought it was something that would be interesting to weave into the to the story in a realistic way, not uh, some fabrication. Uh, they are big and they are powerful. Wow. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Ed Rucker, author of Justice Makes a Killing, which is a legal thriller, and the hero is defense lawyer Bobby Earl. Now, Ed, is Bobby based on anyone in particular? Uh, he's uh, uh, sort of an, uh, uh, an accumulation of the traits of many criminal defense lawyers I've known. Uh, he's a brilliant trial lawyer uh, who's absorbed in defending his clients uh, which makes it uh, difficult for him to have uh, a, uh, a meaningful relationship with his girlfriend, Sam, who is a uh, district attorney in in Los Angeles. Uh, the, the pressure of trials, which is enormous when uh, you're trying uh, serious cases, uh, sleepless nights, uh, is... It's just a grip on your concentration. Uh, it's difficult to think of other things when you're in the midst of a trial like that. Uh, so there's this tension between uh, trying to have a, a life outside of his cases as well as the tension of being in a relationship with a prosecutor because the relationships today between prosecutors and defense lawyers have sort of morphed into much more than just a professional rivalry in court. It's uh, very tribal uh, that uh, when I first started to practice, uh, there was much more of a congenial relationship. Uh, cases were tried uh, very hard. Uh, 
uh, there was a lot of tension in the courtroom. But once the case was concluded, uh, you could go out and have a drink with a prosecutor and laugh about which which of you had got the best of the other. Uh, but today there there's sort of an attitude such as uh, portrayed in much television articles that uh, the defense lawyers are not someone to be uh, respected by the prosecutors, that they're somehow doing uh, a job that doesn't uphold the constitutional balance between the state and individual citizens. Uh, so by her having a relationship with Bobby Earl, Sam's colleagues won't trust her as much. They think that somehow she may be sharing information with him and things of that nature, which makes it a very, very difficult thing for her. I feel like in the past there was even, you know, prosecutors would leave the prosecutor's office and join the, def you know, the become defense attorney sometimes, or maybe the other way around. Sure. But sure. Not so okay. much anymore. No, no. Well, they, 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 no. Now they they join the prosecutor's office in uh, their become career prosecutors, uh, and, or. Uh, work to be elevated to the bench and uh -huh. become judges. Uh, most of our our judges are uh, former prosecutors. prosecutors. So, you know, I, um, in the current Democratic primary race, I happen to like many of the candidates, but I like Kamala Harris as one of the ones, and she gets some flack for being a former prosecutor. Well, I, I I think it was uh, less criticism of the role of a prosecutor as some of the positions she took here in California on the death penalty and uh, uh, the release of evidence in cases where someone uh, uh, seems to have been uh, – uh, convicted who might have been innocent uh, and so things things about how she uh, performed her role rather than just the fact that she was a prosecutor that's generally did, something that, that's now did you ever go up against her no she was no. the attorney general she uh, which rarely has a criminal prosecution and uh. Uh, and she was never uh, uh, a uh, trial lawyer in the office that I'm aware of. She was the district attorney of, I think, San Francisco to start. These are all administrative type positions. Okay, okay. Now, in when I was reading your bio, and it mentioned uh, that you represented William Harris, a member of the Symbionese, Symbionese Liberation Army. Just just last night, I was watching an old episode. I've been watching the old three seasons of Veronica Mars because they have a new season now, you know, 15 years later that I, or however many years that I wanted to watch. So I, I had never watched the old ones. And that's a detective. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's a, a basically a girl detective uh, uh -huh. in California. And Patty Hearst was actually on the show last night huh. <laughs> playing uh, an heiress who with a social conscious conscience yeah and yeah <laughs> uh, so i thought that was funny that so uh interesting yeah and it uh one of the the themes in the the first book uh, the inevitable witness is uh, the effect of publicity on how the participants in the justice system react and uh, the S the uh, Symbionese Liberation Army uh, case had uh, huge publicity around it and it, it affects how 
the lawyers present themselves in court and how the judge is under pressure and the prosecutor is under certain pressure. So publicity is also a factor, and it w- mm-hmm. I thought it was something that might be interesting to explore in the first book. Well, Ed, why don't you read a little bit from Justice Makes a Killing? Sure. I'd, why don't I read the opening California Highway Patrol Officer Randy Phillips had been following the Red Jaguar for the last 20 minutes, making sure to stay a safe half-mile back. Under his Kevlar vest, the T-shirt was stuck to his back with sweat. Christ, he mumbled to himself. Where are they? He reached down to give his holster a reassuring tug, then nervously fingered the lock mechanism on his pistol's hammer. Keeping the Jaguar in sight was easy. Highway 5 ran ruler straight across the scrub brush desert towards Los Angeles, two hours away, and the asphalt lanes ahead were empty under the blistering afternoon sun. But this waiting had his gut in a knot. He clamped his eyes shut for a moment to ease the tension. When he opened them, sweat stung his eyes. Come on, come on, he whispered. Let's do this. Suddenly his radio squawked. Car 259. We have visual. He bent forward to look up into the cloudless sky. A black and white helicopter was above, keeping pace with the Jaguar like a kite being pulled on a string. He stomped on the accelerator. The big cruiser quickly closed the distance and roared up within inches of the Jaguar, red lights flashing, sirens shrieking. The Jaguar slowed immediately and rolled to a stop on the gravel shoulder. There was no movement inside. The cruiser halted a curious ten yards back. The helicopter swooped down and hovered loudly just above kicking up a swirling cloud of sand and dust around the cars. The cruiser's door flew open, and Officer Phillips rolled out to crouch behind it. His breath came in short pants. He gripped his Smith & Wesson in both hands and pointed it through his open window frame at the silent Jaguar. Raise your hand so I can see them, he shouted into the din of the helicopter's engines. Show your left arm out the window. After a moment, an arm appeared out the driver's window. Now step out of the car and keep your hands in the air. Lie face down on the pavement. The driver's door opened, and an elegant woman wearing a fashionable dress stepped out. She shielded her face against the sting of the churning sand with one hand and pushed down her billowing skirt with the other. She yelled over the roar of the helicopter. There must be some mistake. My name is Kathleen Carlson. I'm a lawyer. What's the meaning of that? Now, one hour earlier, the howl of the siren frightened the pigeons off the roof of H Block. The birds rose as one and circled frantically in the California sky above Haywood Private Prison. A voice barked over the loudspeaker. This is not a drill. Lockdown. I repeat. Lockdown. On the exercise yard, the clusters of inmates in orange jumpsuits stared up at the gun tower. Below the rifleman's perch, a sign read, We don't fire warning shots. The the men turned and sullenly trudged back inside, grumbling among themselves. Rows of cell doors clanked shut in a rolling chorus of slamming steel. Once locked in, the inmates erupted into an thunderous clamor of defiance and complaint at the loss of their yard time. In the east wing, A guard ran along an empty cement hallway, breathing hard as he lumbered toward the visitor's room. The thudding of his steel-toed boots echoed off the walls. 
When he reached the sally port to the visitor's room, he stopped abruptly and stared in alarm. The steel-barred gate was open. The gate was never supposed to be left open. He moved cautiously to the edge of the entrance, then darted a look around the doorway. Inside the small entry room, a black guard sat slumped against the wall, his legs stretched out before him. His head was bowed as if looking down in disbelief at the red stain spreading across his khaki green shirt. A few feet away, Sergeant Clyde Ratner stood with one boot planted firmly on the neck of a prone inmate who lay motionless on the cement floor. The inmate's face was pressed down into a slowly widening pool of blood. The smell of cordite hung in the air. Don't stand there, Ratner shouted. Help Travis. The guard stood rooted to his spot at the gate, staring down in wide-eyed panic. Johnson, move. Startled into action, Johnson went to the fallen figure. He knelt down. Then he hesitated. He looked up at Ratner, who glared back at him. He turned back and slowly reached out to press two fingers against the black man's neck. After a moment, he rose and stumbled backward with a stunned look on his face. Staring down at the stricken guard, I think he's dead. Oh, my God. Travis is dead. Johnson. Listen to me, Ratner yelled at the frozen guard. Look at me. Snap out of it. Call for the ambulance and the medical team. Just then, the inmate on the floor breathed out a moan. Small bubbles formed at the corners of his mouth, floated out onto the smooth red pool. What about him, the guard asked. Ratner spat. Take care of Travis. And that was Ed Rucker reading from the opening of Justice Makes a Killing. When you sat down to write the story, did you have the whole plot worked out ahead of time? Uh, Yeah. In order to, in my view, to uh, craft a uh, engaging legal thriller mystery, you you have to have the pieces in place uh, before you sit down to really craft the language. You have to have uh, the clues sparsed out. You have to know the conclusion. Uh, I know that some writers just start writing, but I, I, I can't do that because I... Uh, I don't know, maybe I don't have enough uh, brain power to do it, but uh, I I have to keep a chart to show where a certain fact was was revealed along the way, uh, what characters have done this, what characters have done that. So I've got it pretty much uh, almost scene by scene before I really start to write. So you create the chart ahead of time? Uh, Before you start writing? Yeah, so that uh, I make sure I don't uh, miss anything or forget to put it in. I don't find it satisfying to have a solution uh, to solve the mystery all of a sudden pop up in the last two pages of the book from nowhere. (laughs) Uh, So it's got to be planned to sort of uh, when it happens, uh, to have the reader look back and go, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, he did this and he did that, and uh, I didn't spot it, uh, but it's there. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. As you're writing it, are you the type of writer who will um, write it very quickly and then go back and, and edit after the fact, or do you edit as you go? Uh, <clears throat> I edit a lot. I try and have the the first draft uh, 
I work on it as I don't write quickly. I work on it when it, I put it down. I write on yellow pads. Uh, when I go to type it, uh, I'll edit some then. And once I have the book, I uh, go through it several times, editing. Uh, and in fact, uh, speaking out the dialogue out loud so that it it uh, it sounds the way people really talk. Oh, that's fair. That's a good tip for writers. Yeah, it uh, it's amazing how you can craft a sentence or a piece of dialogue but if you actually say it 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 uh, sounds to your ear uh, somewhat clumsily uh, so uh, being able to speak it I think uh, at least for me uh, helps uh, for something to flow so that uh, the reader isn't bounced off the page uh, as it goes along. Now, one of the kind of legal technicalities that really struck me from from this book, from Justice Makes a Killing, had to do with how limited Bobby Earle was in theories that he could put forth. Um, you, you know, you talk about, you take the facts and you weave an alternate an alternate, you know, the defense story is different from the prosecutor's story, but he, he had a pretty good story that he wasn't really allowed to tell because of this third party culpability. Mm -hmm. Law, yeah, can you explain that a little bit? Sure. It, it's one of the, the flaws of television depictions is uh, they'll portray a lawyer who in cross-examining a witness will uh, sort of uh, spout off a, a monologue of uh, what he would like the evidence to be but has no evidence to really support it. Uh, well, weren't you jealous of this and, and didn't you go there that night and do this, you know, without anything? So in California and most states, there's a law that says that someone with a motive uh, to do the crime other than the defendant is not enough alone to be able to present that to the jury. Uh, you have to have, in addition to motive and, op and opportunity, you have to have some physical connection between that other suspect and the crime itself. Uh, and that that is where it gets tough. Uh, Bobby Earl is faced with uh, great motives from these private prison individuals and the, and the uh, union guards. Uh, but without a connection, he can't even bring it up in court. Uh, you need to have a witness. You have to have a piece of physical evidence, something other than just a motive and an opportunity. Uh, so that, that is the law. Uh, so it's, it's not like on television. Uh, and it's one thing that's depicted in the book uh, and explained and the frustration that comes from that and, and how Bobby Earl gets around it. And I also found it interesting that when one of the witnesses gets killed, he's mm -hmm. not allowed to explain or to, to tell the jury what right. happened. Right. Uh, it, 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 that's the relevance uh, standard. In other words, if a witness is unavailable to testify, the prosecution is allowed to read a uh, previous statement.
statement from the witness if it was uh, made very close to the events. In other words, if someone said, oh, my God, uh, they've just been uh, shot, uh, they're lying there, uh, the police come, uh, and they say, oh, my God, my husband shot me, and then they later uh, die, uh, that that type of statement can come in. Uh, so we have a, a situation where the, the guard made a, a statement of what happened, and then then he is killed. Uh, so uh, under under the laws, uh, the statement comes in, but the all the jury is ever told <clears throat> is that the person is not available. And the rationale is that if the the reason of the of the death particularly one under suspicious circumstances, would allow the jury to speculate about what was happening, who was responsible, uh, and so they just eliminate the possibility of that. (laughs) Although it seems like, you know, if witnesses are being knocked off, that that might have some bearing on whether the defendant is guilty or not. Uh, yes, but it, the jury might also think the defendant is doing it. Uh, mm. uh, so, yeah, uh, yeah. So, but, I guess you're right about that. Mm-hmm. Wow, well, well. You're listening to Writers' Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Ed Rucker, author of Justice Makes a Killing. Now, Ed, this is the second legal thriller in the that you have published is there a third one in the works well i'm uh thinking of uh bobby earl dealing with a uh case that he is appointed to be the appellate lawyer but not to write briefs but to uh, present new evidence that seems to uh, point to an individual who's been convicted of a murder in 1975, many, many years ago. Uh, and it was a uh, interesting time in, in Los Angeles uh, around the Manson people, uh, the start of the Chicano movement, in in Los Angeles with uh, forced sterilization of uh, Hispanic women at the General Hospital Uh, and uh, the oil industry. Most people don't realize that the real attraction of California uh, in the past was not necessarily agricultural jobs, but jobs in the oil industry. At one point in uh, our history, California provided 25% of all the oil in the nation. And currently in Los Angeles, just today, there are 3,000 active oil wells in Los Angeles. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Uh, So it's it you know some, once again some things that might be interesting to weave into a into a story. Yeah. Now, have you ever thought of or actually written um, about your the trials that you participated in? That no, you were the it, it, it it raises real ethical problems mm. when a defendant speaks to his lawyer. Everything that defendant says is privileged and can't be revealed. Can't be revealed during the case. It can't be revealed many, many years later. Mm-hmm. So to have inside information of a case uh, <laughs> would uh, would run up against that. So no, I, I haven't. And it wouldn't be proper. Do details from your career make their way into the book in, you know, disguised form? 
Well, sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, I tried over 200 jury trials, and I tried uh, 13 death penalty cases to juries. So you you constantly, uh, in in that type of uh, situation, you you see things and you remember things. Uh, so the the things that happen in the book are are very realistic and authentic, uh, which uh, don't have to be presented in a pedantic uh, uh, type of style because they're they're interesting just in themselves, just as you brought out how frustrating it is not to be able to bring in what seems like uh, valuable information for the defense uh, because of the laws. You know, it's it's... Trials are high drama. So, Ed, when you said when you retired and you started writing, um, did you have a publisher lined up, or or how did you find your publisher? And tell us a little bit about how you work with uh, Chickadee Prince Books. Well, uh, originally I had an agent in New York, uh, but he couldn't place the books with uh, one of the frontline publishers, um, which is, uh, it, it, it's not that I have uh, written the uh, great American novel here, uh, but, uh, pub- but publishing houses now uh, are under uh, economic stress and they have to be sure if they put the money and resources into publishing a book, it's going to be a big, big seller. Uh, so uh, we searched around and found this less lauded publishing house, and they and they take a chance on on first time authors. Uh, so it, it it's been a great. Uh, great collaboration so the book now is available at Amazon any independent bookstore uh, and uh, I hope people take a chance and of course you can probably order it online as well yeah through uh, through Amazon you can get it uh, yeah. just put in Ed Rucker and or the the title Although we, we'd love to support the local bookstores, the independent Absolutely. bookstores. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree entirely. I agree entirely. They're, they're under siege. Yeah, so. And how, local... how long does it take you to write one of these legal thrillers? Oh, probably a couple of years. Oh. Uh, I start putting it together. Uh, Maybe a year, year and a half, really, um, and that's working pretty much full time on it. Is your writing process like you when you're when you're writing a book, you sit down at the desk every day and you work a certain number of hours, or wait to write a certain number of words, or well, or do I, you... I I I I found that I end up writing. Uh, about four hours uh, because after that I start to lose steam so when I when I hit that I just sense that this is it Uh, but I try and leave where I know where I'm going next so that when I sit down the next day I, I'm ready to go, but when I feel like I'm not sharp enough to continue that day, even though I know what I want to tackle next, uh, I'll, I'll leave it uh, so that I can do it. And then after the writing, I'll, I'll do some uh, typing of the the previous day's work 
then when I sit down the next day, I'll go through what I'd written the day before and then pick up where I'd uh, left off. Okay, because you mentioned that you write on the yellow pad, but you don't do the whole thing and then start typing. You, you type as, right. you, as you go. That's interesting. Do you feel like there's a stronger like mental connection with the pen than if you typed, the, you know, use the computer keyboard from the beginning? Yeah, I, just, <clears throat> I, I did a lot of uh, legal writing uh, in my career. I wrote a, uh, well, the set of books <clears throat> on California criminal practice. Uh, it's in its fourth edition. It's seven volumes long. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> and so I get, uh, I, I just get in the habit that I somehow I don't think I can actually consider anything or think without having a pen in my hand. <laughs> yeah. I know the feeling. Yeah. I know the feeling. Well, Ed, we're out of time, and I really want to thank you for being with us today on Writer's Voices. Well, I enjoyed it very much, Monica. Thank you for the opportunity. And we always close with a quote. Usually my mom finds the quote, but since she's not here today, I researched one of my favorite people to quote, Mark Twain, and what he has to say about justice. And one of his quotes is, It is a worthy thing to fight for one's freedom. It is another sight finer to fight for another man's. Oh, that's nice.